Your time to talk, though, to the Minister for Families and Social Services and the Minister for Women's Safety, Anne Rustin. To take us there, here was the Prime Minister explaining why he called Bridget Archer into his office after she crossed the floor. Bridget and I are close colleagues and we have, we have a very good friendship. And uh, I was pleased to be there with uh, Senator Payne and, and Josh Frydenberg and to be there to support Bridget. It was a very warm and friendly and supportive meeting. Bridget is a close friend and colleague and uh, I wanted to ensure that she was being supported. Anne Rustin, welcome to the program. Hi David. So did any of the coalition men who crossed the floor this week need that sort of supporting or only Bridget Archer? Well, well, David, I think it's an entirely reasonable proposition when somebody expresses uh, an opinion different to government policy and then acts on it, that the Prime Minister would seek to find out what their concerns were in an effort to try and resolve them. And that's exactly um, consistent with how the Prime Minister would deal with any other uh, backbencher that sought to cross the floor. Um, and I can assure you that the Prime Minister did meet um, with Senator Antic and, and Senator Rennick last week, as he would have met, I'm sure, with every other Liberal Party senator that had crossed the floor in the time he's been the Prime Minister. She's, uh, Bridget Archer has uh, told Sam Maiden, though, that she wasn't comfortable having a meeting at that time. She wanted a bit more time. Was it appropriate, do you think, for her to be brought in straight away? Well, I, I don't know the circumstances of how the meeting was set up, but what I do know is that it was entirely consistent. There was nothing different about... Uh, the Prime Minister seeking to meet with Bridget Archer um, than, than any other time um, under a similar circumstance. So I'm absolutely mm. confident that the Prime Minister only sought to meet with Bridget because he wanted to know what her concerns were. Um, because, of course, we would always want, as a government, to try and resolve those concerns. On the National Integrity Commission, will any legislation come before the Parliament before the end of the year? Well, I, I think the Prime Minister has been very clear, as has the Attorney General. Um, if the Labor Party are prepared to, to support the legislation that is currently um, before them, uh, then we will bring it into the Parliament and we'll pass it as quickly as but, they but will allow on. us to. You're in government. It's, you need to bring it into Parliament, don't you? You can't just blame Labor when you haven't brought anything to Parliament. Well, one of the most important things under, uh, for something as important as an integrity commission is, is to make sure that it passes. The last thing we want is to bring a bill into this place and then find out that it doesn't get through. But what's so the bill? I, what is the bill? What's it going to look like? How, how can well, anyone decide which way to vote until you show them? Well, the, the bill's been out as an exposure draft for, for, for uh, I think, 12 months. Um, but I, I think what we are trying to do... And that's it? Do, There's no change to that bill? Uh, my understanding is there's no change to the bill. The bill that was re um, provided to the Labor Party that we sought their support 12 months ago is the bill that we currently wish to bring into the Parliament and we're asking for the Labor Party support because we believe that the bill is a, is a, a fair balance between making sure that um, serious corruption is called out and dealt with, but at the same time we want to maintain the, uh, the rule of law in this country and that's that you must be presumed innocent until you're proven guilty uh, and need to be really careful you're not convicted in the court of public opinion before you have your chance to say, uh, to put your case forward. Yeah, but there are a number of criticisms of that original bill and if, if you need the government's now just going to stick with that, uh, even some of your own colleagues uh, have concerns. Under that model, politicians can only be questioned secretly. Uh, there'd be no transparency for the public to see what's, what's going on. A federal police officer, however, would have to face a full public hearing. Um, does that different standard make any sense? Well, one of the things that we do need to be really careful of is that you don't set up a structure that then allows for political purpose and political gain one party to actually prosecute um, somebody from another party just for that political gain. I mean, we've seen the, um, the Shadow Attorney General try and refer numerous things in relation to, to political gamesmanship and we need to make sure that doesn't happen. But, but equally, if it doesn't matter who you are in public life, if you are found to have... Um, you know, to be corrupt, then there are processes that need to be put in place and will be put in place. There are existing mechanisms in a, in a lot of areas and what this bill seeks to do is to fill the gap that says serious corruption needs to be dealt with appropriately, um, but we mustn't let this turn into something that's some sort of a sideshow. It must be fit for purpose. All right, just before we leave this area though, on the process, you're sticking with the original model, but you won't introduce it unless Labor now comes out and says what they're going to do? Well, I think a, a bipartisan approach to something as important as an integrity commission, I think would send a very strong message to the Australian public that all of us take
take seriously um, the issue of, of serious corruption. And, and um, you know, I would be delighted if the Labor Party was prepared to come forward and support this. I mean, the, this uh, our, our particular bill suggests that the powers of the Commission are well in excess of, of a Royal Commission. So I, I think it is, uh, it is a good balanced bill that balances out, as I said, calling out corruption, but at the same time protecting the innocence of those until they're proven guilty. Uh, just moving on, the Prime Minister is today announcing new legislation to target online trolls. No government in the world has managed to stop social media bullying. How does the government intend to do it? Well, what this um, particular bill that we're proposing to bring in this week does two things. One is to say um, to social media platforms, you cannot allow somebody to post um, material that is going to be defamatory or damaging or injure an individual anonymously uh, and get away with it. So what we would now seek to do is uh, have a mechanism where there's a complaints mechanism. So if somebody thinks that they are being defamed, bullied or, or attacked on social media, that they will have an opportunity to require the platform to take it down. And if they fail to do so, then there will be uh, a court process that will allow that person to require the platform to, um, to provide details of the identity of the, um, the abusive or defa defaming um, identity so that they can take the necessary processes through a legal uh, you know, through the court process. I mean, it is absolutely unacceptable that a platform can shirk its responsibility to say, well, we don't know who it is, so you just go ahead and defame and bully. And we've seen the consequences of this so many times in Australia. Yeah, but this is the thing. If you're going to say to Twitter and Facebook that they have to identify every one of their users, <laughs> they might just laugh and say, oh, okay, we're not going to operate in Australia. Um, do, do you think they could possibly do that, identify all of their billions of users? Well, I'd really like to see any of these platforms stand up there and say that they think it's acceptable, that they hide behind the anonymity of, you know, bots and bullies and bigots online and say, wash their hands of it. I mean, it, you know, how is their credibility and integrity going to look if they try and do something like that? I think the whole world should be asking um, these platforms to take a absolutely much more responsible approach to how they deal with this. I mean, we've seen people take their own lives as a result of some of this behaviour from, uh, from anonymous bullies and it's just not acceptable. You can't do it in real life, you can't do it you know, offline, so why should you be allowed to do it online? Mm. No, there's, it's a very real problem, but on the practicality of asking the social media giants to identify their users, I'm not sure if the government's consulted its e-safety commissioner on this, Julian McGrant has said, it would be very challenging, I would think, for Facebook, for example, to re-identify or identify its 2.7 billion users. How do they practically go back and do that? It is a good question. Are you suggesting that's what Facebook and Twitter should do, identify all of their users? Well, I mean, I think what we're saying here is this is a starting point to deal with a really, really serious issue. Um, and obviously, um, you know, Gillian and Grant has done an amazing job with the Online Safety mm. Act in making She's Australians this is safer. Impractical. Well, I think what we need to do is we need to work out how we can actually get past some of the... Clearly there will be challenges. I don't think anybody's this, this suggesting is the there challenge. Be. This is the challenge. How do you get past it? Just to be clear on this, you're saying Facebook and Twitter need to identify everybody on their platform. Well, in effect, everybody on their platform should be identified. Why should somebody be allowed to be able to make comments that potentially could lead to really serious impacts on other people and remain anonymous? I so mean, if they don't just, do that, sorry, if they don't do that uh, and, and threaten to shut down in Australia, um, would that be okay? Is, that, is the government willing to go that far? Well, I, I think the government will be working with its um, like-minded nations around the world. We've seen the UK take a similar approach and I, and I think the rest of the world probably has exactly the same problems that we do. And I think that collectively, um, you know, nations around the world need to protect their citizens from this really insidious new way of bullying. And if they say no, we're not going to identify all of our users and something in a defamation case ends up in court, uh, the story this morning suggested that taxpayers might help fund the, the legal case, the litigation against the social media giants from individual users who feel they've been defamed. Is that right? Would taxpayers actually get involved in this? I think the government wants to send a very strong message that, that we are really serious about this. And if, uh, you know, if the big guys, if the, if the platforms decide that they don't want to play model litigants, um, then we will take them on. So this is a very strong message to everybody that we're really serious about this. So we're anyone serious. who wants to sue Twitter, taxpayers might be footing the bill. 
Well, there is a because it's going through a, a court process. Not everybody can go and sue Twitter. There actually has to be demonstrated through the court process that there is a case to be answered for. We're not going to be going to Facebook and Twitter and saying just because somebody said something they don't like that they're going to have to identify the person. This is about serious abuse and defamation that's occurring online. And so it would only be under those circumstances that met the federal court okay. threshold that would be intending to do this. Just on your portfolio, uh, this has been an extraordinary year when it comes to the focus on the treatment of women. When are we going to see your draft national plan to end violence against women and children? Your department had suggested we'd see it by the end of the year. Yeah, well, you will see it by the, the end of the year, and I can absolutely assure everybody listening that the new plan will be in place when the existing plan um, finishes on the 30th of June 2022. Um, but at the moment, we're just going through the final stages of, uh, and it will be provided to women's safety ministers in all the states and territories around Australia and back to the advisory groups um, that have been advising us through the process. So we're very close to the draft plan being released for final consultation, uh, and hopefully it will be released publicly in its final state early next year. So it'll be released publicly early next year, not this year? Well, we will le release the draft plan this year, but obviously oh, we'll take that, the opportunity okay. to make any changes that may come from that consultation. Look, six months ago you also announced a two-year extension of, of funding for domestic violence support services. Has any of that money actually hit the ground yet? Uh, New South Wales um, have, have finalised and, and New South Wales have the money. We're continuing to work with the other states and territories to understand um, where their areas of demand are. Uh, but you know, we will continue to, to make sure that the that frontline services are getting the money that they need. So only, uh, only New South Wales has received this money, no, no other state? No other state has signed up the documentation. I mean, obviously, we're very keen for them to do so and would certainly encourage them um, to sign the documentation so that the money can flow. But at this stage, we have not received any advice to suggest that states and territories um, are requiring the money immediately. But, of course, um, the money has been promised and the money will be delivered. Well, it's pretty clear that service providers need the money on the ground, though. I mean, they're regularly turning away sometimes half the women and children who turn up seeking crisis accommodation. The, the level of support right now, it's pretty clear it's inadequate, isn't it? Well, the responsibility for, for frontline services rests with the states and territories, but we made the decision through the COVID pandemic to provide them with $130 million of additional support so that they could support the increase in demand that we really sadly saw during the pandemic. And then we made a decision to, in, to continue that $130 million a year for this year and for next year. But that's in addition uh, to a $1.1 billion commitment in the budget this year as a down payment on the next national plan. So the government is absolutely committed to be providing support across all areas to support not just people who are responding uh, when we see the horrible situations of domestic violence, but also to make sure that we are there when it comes to prevention, early intervention and recovery. Anne Rustin, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, David.